to IEP Radio, a show dedicated to the education of all things indoor environmental quality related. And now here's your host, Michael Schrantz. Welcome to IEP Radio. This is episode 22. Today I'm going to be talking with uh, Nikki Kroger uh, with Thermostore uh, about dehumidification, dealing with moisture control and ventilation. Uh, probably two of the top topics I commonly have uh, with clients uh, because it's important. Um, we are dealing with controlling moisture to minimize microbial growth. Um, the consequences of elevated moisture don't just stop there. We deal with off-gassing concerns, chemicals. We deal with production of dust mites. And so there is such a thing as too much. There is such a thing as too little. I'm going to be diving into those details with Nikki today uh, and also uh, covering a little bit on uh, mechanical ventilation, which is a huge topic too, because we know that when we're trying to create and or maintain a sanctuary uh, in a building, it, usually it's a bunch of things that we're doing to, in concert with each other uh, to create that net effect, um, ventilation, filtration, dehumidification, obviously removing sources if uh, we can identify them, all those good things. So I look forward uh, to you guys being able to listen to this. Uh, we had an excellent conversation, a little bit ba about Nikki right now. She has been involved in the indoor air quality industry for over 15 years. Uh, she is a ResNet certified home uh, energy rater. She sits on the ResNet uh, SDC 200 committee is a board member of the Maryland Building Performance Association and a member of the uh, ACA Manual Low Load Homes Advisory Committee. Uh, Nikki has worked with the uh, building science industry icons to develop and produce a two-day hands-on crawl space encapsulation training program that recently has been adopted by North Carolina's uh, Building Performance Association as their credentialing program. As she is an active member of the Spray uh, Polyurethane uh, Foam Association and currently participating on the Building Envelope Committee as well as on the Certification and Safety Committees educates and trains builders, HVAC contractors, architects, engineers, crawl space contractors, and other professionals in the industry on the building science of ventilation and moisture control in buildings. I guarantee you, you're going to have a good time listening to this amazing interview that I was able to have with Nikki. Nikki, welcome to the show. Thank you. You know, a lot of the people that I work with, uh, primarily are folks who have chronic illness. Um, these are folks that, you know, uh, oftentimes are dealing with things day to day. This is not an allergy. This is not, uh, they stub their toe, they just go to the hospital, get a Band-Aid, it makes them better. And a lot of those folks with chronic illness, uh, one of the common um, exposure sites are homes or buildings. Uh, in fact, a majority of the people I work with and who I speak with the big part of their home is, is it water damaged, uh, you know, is there off gassing of materials. And so there's this huge correlation. And I'm really excited to have you on board today because, you know, a big topic, or there's actually two, uh, is dehumidification or moisture control and also a little bit on ventilation. So I wanted to kind of throw some things at you. I know I've already introduced you and, and again, given your background, um, I want to talk about moisture right now. Sure. Um, I, I know when... Filtration, yes. just so we don't forget it, because oh, filtration please. is huge too. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And so moisture probably is the biggest thing that helps us the most. And we get into filtration, we get into mechanical ventilation, source removal when we're dealing with where's the contamination at or how can we contain it or dilute it. I know these are all very familiar things with you. Um, as it relates to moisture control, I think the takeaway here is it's always a balance too much and you're looking at other, you know, all sorts of problems, whether it's off gassing issues, uh, microbial production, um, and, and the list keeps on going on. Um, even dust mites. Um, I, I remember seeing that graph that you had sent in one of your articles. And it's the same one I have in one of my report templates that I show everybody to give them this idea of pounds, but on too dry, then you deal with respiratory issues and, and, and all of these things. And I know that dehumidification is a consideration in many parts of the world. We know that by design, some air conditioning systems that provide cooling can help remove some moisture, but inherently they are not dehumidifiers by, by their primary design and function. Uh, so for the general audience, do you have a simple tip uh, to offer regarding when a person may consider the need for dehumidification? When should they start worrying? What's the metric? What's the test? I would say that um, if it's from a health standpoint, we definitely want to stay where we're sensing the humidity. 
at 55%. So that may mean that we will need to actually lower our controller, if it's for the dehumidifier or whatever strategy we're using to 50%, to try to achieve that 55% uniformly throughout the home, especially in bedrooms, you know, for dealing with dust mites, um, other VOC off-gassing in bedrooms, which are usually a little bit more isolated, um, then we want to make sure that we are controlling the farthest place, which is usually when we're sensing it's the thermostat or a controller located near the thermostat. So for so definitely for health, and I, been working on projects where, you know, there was a woman who went undiagnosed with Lyme's disease for years and her doctor absolutely recommended that she had to keep it at 40% relative humidity during the humid months in her home for her health. So it can be all over the place, but in general, we know that if we keep it at 50 to 55%, a lot of that, the respiratory issues can be minimized. You're speaking amongst friends. I mean, when you said Lyme, for example, uh, for those that are listening who do suffer from that, there's always the thing about if you don't treat the mold, you can't treat the Lyme and people have all these other issues. So moisture control is huge. I mean, I, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to swing and miss here, but I know that there's certain climates where maybe the discussion of dehumidification is more of an obvious one when you think about certain coastal climates or you think about Florida. I always pick on Florida or like Houston, Texas or things of that nature, but there's gray area. It's not black and white. It's not like when you step over the state line, all of a sudden you might not be need dehumidification. Are there parts of the country, and I'm not holding you to it, but that you see dehumidification as not such a huge concern? Um, so we typically say if you live in a green grass climate, anywhere where you're getting about an inch of rain or more a week during the spring, summer, and fall, you are going to need some sort of dehumidification strategy at some point. Right. So um, and if you look at dew point maps, you can usually see where you start getting above the, the 50 uh, degree, 55 degree dew points. As soon as you're hitting 60 degree dew points, you're going to probably need some sort of dehumidification. Now, obviously, well, I mean, I would say desert areas, but to be honest with you, we sell dehumidifiers into Arizona because of monsoon season. Yeah. Um, so there are areas, and it also has to do with not only what's going on outside the home, but potentially what's going on inside. Do we have water features? Do we have aquariums? Are we growing a lot of indoor plants? Um, Are we a tight building with a lot of occupants? A lot of, and, and multifamily especially. So, you know, a lot of times we'll get calls from the West Coast uh, the, you know, Washington and Oregon, where people typically think, oh, it's really wet up there. They're going to need a lot of dehumidification. But the reality is dew points are pretty low in those areas. But when we look at multifamily and we start getting four people in smaller spaces, um, there's a lot of moisture generation. Absolutely. You might not always be able to handle that with just bringing in drier outdoor air. So, I want to transition a little bit then where when we talk about units and I want to eventually get to what thermostore, I know it's like this, this they got these com compilation of, of different devices that serve different functions. But before we do that, a semi segue might be into the topic of um, whole house uh, dehumidification versus portable systems. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, is there any rule of thumb for that? I mean, somebody is sitting here listening right now. They, they realize that you know, in their homes, they didn't even think that they should be measuring uh, relative humidity. But after listening to us, and they realized that, you know what, maybe, maybe my house is too humid, and I do need to take efforts, but I'm not sure what to go, what to what to get what to purchase. I've heard about whole house systems that you somehow hook to your ductwork, And I hear about these standalones, what would make somebody choose? Uh, okay, assuming they they have ductwork, why would one choose portable versus whole house? Sure. So typically, if you have a basement in your in maybe the Midwest or the Northeast, then we would start with dedicated dehumidification in the basement. Typically basements um, are going to have a lot more moisture. They're cooler, which means relative humidity is higher. And that's why in the industry, we really want to make sure that we also understand dew point. Yeah. So talk to, talk to dew point a little bit. Talk sure. to dew point. So dew point is the temperature that we're actually going to see 
water start condensing. So in the morning, in the fall and spring, maybe when you get up and look outside and you've got green grass and there's dew all over the grass, that's because the temperature um, in the air had, or the, the moisture temperature has hit dew point. So the absolute measure of moisture is, is dew point. 100% right. relative humidity means that we've, we've um, hit the dew point temperature and we're at saturation. Now we get condensation, now and this is where, among other things, I know we could talk all day long about off-gassing yeah. issues and other things, but for a lot of my audience members, this is where the microbial growth starts to creep in at a much quicker pace. Much quicker pace. And so in basements and in crawl spaces, so underneath the homes, that condensation has a lot of opportunity um, to generate mold growth or microbial growth because we've got water pipes, we've got, you know, areas that aren't necessarily insulated the best. We have hot air coming into cool air typically. So condensation um, in basements or crawl spaces. And if we can remove some of the moisture in the air, and as a byproduct of using a standalone dehumidifier, you also generate some heat yeah. into that space, which will increase the relative humidity and really help control um, any chance of microbial growth. So Typically in those regions, if someone is having a humidity problem and because 50% of the air in your living space is coming from below the house, I recommend starting below. And, and it's not just adding a dehumidifier, right? We need to look at those spaces and say, okay, do I have bulk water? Because a dehumidifier isn't gonna fix that. Yeah, right. Um, do I have a lot of infiltration from the outside coming into those spaces? Well, then we, we're gonna have to do some air sealing um, and make sure that we're setting up the dehumidifier to be successful and really control that space. So I know I'm setting myself for, for a juicy response. I promise you 80% <laughs> of it's intentional. So is it safe to assume that if somebody has a multi-level house and they have a basement and they slam a, a standalone dehumidifier, that that's going to take care of the moisture for the remaining uh, levels of the home? Uh, no, absolutely not. Because we, we don't know what's going on in those remaining levels. Plus, people generate a lot of moisture um, in our living spaces. So typically about a quarter a pound per person. So a family of four, um, two pints or pounds, a pint's a pound the world around. Um, is that's going to be two pounds, you know, so 48 pints in, in, in 24 hours. Um, and that's without all the exercise rooms that are going into homes right now. We're seeing a lot of that. A lot of that home offices, students that, you know, kids at home being homeschooled. We are seeing a tremendous amount of indoor air quality issues being recognized in the homes. I'm not saying that they weren't there before, but I think because we're spending so much time, time in our homes, we're actually being more affected to the point where we want to do something about them. Where before you, might say, like, you might say the worst consolation prize from COVID exactly. uh, as a result is the awareness of indoor air quality. Maybe. All of a sudden, it was always something we brushed underneath the side because anytime it's a chronic thing, it's not something you do every day people just have a harder time appreciating. If you go out right now, you get in your car, heaven forbid you get in a car crash, you know what's up and you, you wanna, you learn from that and you, uh, you hope it never happens again, but we're, we're starting to see the symptomology, uh, the complaints uh, increase. Uh, and then for those people who do have chronic illness, uh, what was a manageable situation while they're trying to work on their recovery and the treatment progress is now becoming more and more difficult because even getting out of the house, there's all these parameters of how you have to be. And then most, most people just say, ah, I'm going to stay in my house. And, and the benefit of that is now they actually can focus on making their homes healthy. <laughs> right. And you there's know, a pearl. It is. It, you know, we're, we're more contained to our living spaces and that is something we can control. As soon as we leave our homes, we don't have control at all of our environments. So our homes, we can definitely focus on that, which again, we have to be careful the steps that we take to do that as homeowners, because not all of this can be DIY'd without causing more issues. Amen. Yeah, it, it, I, I did a recent uh, uh, podcast uh, with uh, a, a clinician not too long ago, and uh, 
they were asking questions about uh, ventilation and filtration requirements or suggestions based off of COVID thoughts. And it was such a tricky thing to navigate because um, if you don't consider uh, confounding issues, uh, oh, let's just bring in more mechanical ventilation. Now you dump a bunch of moisture laden air in the house. It's just one of a million examples. Uh, or let's stick a, a MERV rated filter, a higher MERV rated filter for an old system uh, that can't handle the resistance. I know you're very familiar with that. And now you have a condensation leak in the summertime or a frozen coil or the, you know, the, the list goes on. There's these secondary parameters. Let me, let me do one thing. So portable uh, dehumidification totally makes sense. Uh, you got the basement, still need to monitor the upper levels because you don't know Absolutely. the activity. Absolutely. Um, so where, where and why and how would somebody want to go to Whole House then? I know you guys offer those product lines. So where does that sure. fall into this? Sure. A Whole House uh, dehumidifier, I would say, first of all, if you are building or live in already a fairly tight home. So um, if you got spray foam, I mean, you can get a, a really tight house without spray foaming, right? You can caulk it and airtight it really tight. So if you know that you are living in a tight home and you are in a um, green grass climate, um, there is a chance that your air conditioner is not going to run um, enough to handle the moisture load. Yeah. It might, but it might not as well. So you need to monitor that for right. sure. But the whole goal of building a tight energy efficient home is to not run the largest system in our home. It's yeah. to minimize that runtime as much as possible. Yeah. And by doing that, as you said, you know, air conditioning um, is, is designed uh, first and foremost to get to that temperature on the thermostat. That's what we want. We want to get to that temperature. And in our minds, we want to do it as quickly as possible to use as less energy as possible. And as a byproduct, it will dehumidify or remove some moisture. But you need about 20 to 30 minutes of runtime before water starts going down the drain. Right. And most of our homes now, if we, when we start building tighter and tighter, uh, even if it's right sized and not oversized, potentially we're not going to be getting those run times. And I want to talk about the, the uh, not the right size, and, uh, but the oversize, because I, I remember you, and I don't want to gloss over this issue, but um, you sent this article to me. It was a fantastic ar article um, out of the Journal of Light Construction there uh, from 2018, was talking about a couple different things, certainly uh, the challenges of dehumidification in warm climates. Um, but there, there were so many nuggets from this article, and I'll, I'll post a link afterwards for people to find it. It was worth the read. Um, and one of the things, of course, we talk about is overcooling, and it's this issue of whether it's the software that helps these companies size the equipment, or and they have a margin of error, so they might oversize what is needed. Then you have the uh, HVAC contractor that says, well, it's calling for 2.6 tons, so I'm going to add a three ton on there. And then it's oversized further, what you end up having, and you've done a fantastic job in every interview I've ever seen you talk about, uh, explain that, yeah, you, 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 you end up sa maybe satisfying the temperature very quick, but you don't have the run time to even have the uh, evaporator coil remove at least some percentage of the moisture. So in order some people fight that by saying, well, I'll just lower the temperature. Now you're overcooling the house. There ends up being, a, a first, a comfort issue. Second yeah. of all, there are consequences for running it and getting it down to those lower temperatures, including dew point concerns. In reading about that, I, I, I ran across something that I had never thought of. This is a new thing for me, and it was splitting dehumidifiers. Um, I don't, again, I don't want to gloss over any one topic. There's so many juicy things to, to discuss here, but the the idea of a splitting dehumidifier was new to me mm -hmm. and and that type of dehumidification is to service a certain situation could you talk to our audience a little bit about the difference between a dehumidifier and a splitting dehumidifier sure sure so a, a regular dehumidifier has all of the components that basically would be for your air conditioning system the evaporator coil the condensing coil everything in one block box. So your air conditioner, the way that it generates cooling is uh, by discharging the heat or the energy that it is uh, to cool that air, discharging the heat to the outside. That's why we have an inside component and we have an outside component. 
a dehumidifier has it all in one box. So as a byproduct of removing the moisture, we are also generating some heat. Sounds like that heat was a good thing for the basement when it's cold. Yep. And, and it can be a, a lot of times um, if we look at uh, fall and spring, our shoulder seasons, where dehumidification really is needed the most because we're not running a lot of air conditioning. Typically, a little bit of that heat isn't a bad thing. Okay, there's a but, right? There's a but. Um, but in tighter homes, potentially um, where there's gonna be a sensitivity to the heat generated um, or additions, to be honest with you, this unit is used in a lot of additions on houses. Um, that this unit, we are going to discharge the heat outside. And as a byproduct of the dehumidification, we are going to generate some first stage cooling. That's so the part that absolutely floored me. Not <laughs> only did you minimize the heat load, the sensible heat gain that you would feel, and, we've, and many people with dehumidifiers know this, if you feel it coming off the exhaust, it feels warmer coming out. There's that heat you're talking about. But you're getting rid of that. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But actually, because of the process of the Freon and this exchange with the outdoor unit, you were actually able to provide, I think it said a couple times, I forgot what the BTUs, but like 4,000 of cooling. Yeah. Yep. That's yeah. fantastic for mild climate. So what, what type of environment or geographic location would this be an ideal unit for? It, it really is targeted more for the, the warmer, hotter, humid coastal regions, I would say for sure. On the shoulder um, seasons of those areas? Um, actually, no, because that can be used all year to give you your first stage cooling. And if you have a tight house, I, I mean, we have a, a gentleman who, does, who is a passive house builder, and this is the only uh, air conditioning and dehumidification he uses in those homes because you don't need a lot of cooling, but you'll get first stage cooling from this. So this unit is about 70% latent or water focused, removing water and 30% sensible getting to that temperature where an air conditioner is designed to be 70% typically sensible and 30% latent in our more traditional units. I'm not talking really high efficiency units by any means. Um, but yeah, you can get, so this you can get your ventilation, um, MERV 13 filtration. Notice that, yep. Um, and which all our units have. And yep. then also um, some, some air conditioning. Now it is a big unit, obviously. Um, so, but it is very unique and we are starting to see a trend in this unit being used more and more. Um, again, it's, it's always surprising to me, but when people start enclosing um, lanai's or, you know, adding an indoor screen, you know, an indoor um, sunroom kind of yeah. area, this can provide some cooling to that area, but then, you know, potentially you can get dehumidification for the entire home as well. It's, it's 184 pints. It, it's a lot of dehumidification. It's a beast. It's a beast. Um, you have to be a little careful using it in, um, again, if we were, if we're looking at cooler shoulder seasons, maybe in, you know, Midwest up to the Northeast, the challenge will be because it's generating cold air and there's colder air going into it, um, that we, the unit will go into defrost. Uh -huh. Which means so, it's not operating to the audience. No, it's not operating. It's waiting to um, you know, just kind of get those coils, um, some buildup off those and, and, and be able to run again. So you, you have to be careful where you apply it and how you apply it, but definitely it is great in applications where we are concerned about the heat from a dehumidifier. So I want to talk a little bit, um, certainly about um, uh, ventilation. Um, and, but be and I know we're going to end up talking more off and on about uh, dehumidification. Let me bring up a question. I had a client um, I was working with, it's been a few months now, and, and we were talking about solutions and we got to the topic of dehumidification. And we brought up, um, you know, the, they ask you, what unit would you use for my basement area? And I had brought up, you know, I've seen a lot of positive uh, things coming out from the Santa Fe brand. There's this model called the classic uh, basement unit, uh, dehumidifier. I'm sure you've heard of it. Uh, and um, in I've in general, have had great experiences, even with the crawl space models, um, success with high profile 
uh, projects and things of that nature where you're looking for the Cadillac. But I've had a lot of people that look at the price and they see it, for example, they say, oh, well, I get that standalone unit right there for about, you know, say $1,600 or $1,500. And that's not the unit we're talking about right now, but the standalone dehumidifier. Then they go online uh, and they see, um, they see that they can get a unit that apparently is removing around the same pints of water per day uh, for a third the price. What I'm hoping you can do is explain to people what they're really buying here because there's clearly a difference. I figure you do a much better job than me articulating. Sure, sure. So uh, growing up in the Midwest, and I know a lot of people in the Northeast know this as well, most of us had these little standalone portable dehumidifiers from a big box in our basement. And as soon as you turned it past the little one mark, it became a solid block of ice. What? It didn't work as advertised? <laughs> and so our units really are commercial grade. We manufacture um, restoration dehumidifiers that are used uh, by contractors when there's hurricanes, that sort of thing. That's that Phoenix line, which really is a professional line um, used for contractors for cleaning up uh, water disasters. Right, sure. So they're, they're wheeled in, you know, off vans into locations, moved around quite a bit. So all the components used in those dehumidifiers are used in our residential dehumidifiers. Got it, so okay. really getting more of the commercial grade, which we have coils that work better to remove more water, more energy efficiently in cooler. I was going to ask you, that's what I was going to ask you. It's better operating performance at relatively yeah. lower temperatures. Yep. So most, and it's just changing, but uh, most dehumidifiers, when you see like this, the, the classic is what are we at? 110 pints. I think this dehumidifier is. Yeah. Or, um, so that is rated at 80 degrees and 60% relative humidity. That's what the rating um, system has been for dehumidifiers. So that's basically an indoor pool condition. Okay. My basement is not an indoor pool condition. Right. Um, probably about, I mean, maybe 68 degrees, 65 degrees. And as soon as you lower the temperature, the capacity of dehumidifiers goes down. That's less water removal. So that 110 pints, um, probably for our dehumidifier, when you start lowering the temperature, is going to go down to, let's say, 85 or 90 pints. I see. Um, it depends on what the temperature is. Right. That big box unit is going to drastically drop off. Oh, it's see. not designed at all for those cooler temperatures. And the other thing is, is we're manufactured in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, all of those pretty much uh, units that are at big box are, are coming out of China. I see. Okay. So, yeah, no, definitely support the good US of A, um, especially in the, in the times that we're in right now. Um, that, that's, that's an easy argument for me. Um, and what I also like, too, is that not every dehumidifier has filtration. I mean, where is this coming from? It, it, to some people, it's left filled. To me, I feel like I just won the lottery. <laughs> you guys are conscious of what's coming out of the unit as well. Absolutely. And, and, you know, again, whatever air is below our homes is going to make its way into the living space. I mean, right. and maybe your basement is a living space, which is all the more reason to make sure you're using a very effective dehumidifier. Um, but we want to make sure not only are we keeping the, the inside of the dehumidifier clean, but we are also removing whatever's going through that air in order to generate a healthier environment. And we have a six-year warranty on our dehumidifiers. Mm -hmm. um, most of those coming out of, uh, out of China in the big box are usually a one-year warranty. You get what you pay for, and I'll tell you what, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a biased plug and a selfish one, but meant with, uh, good, for good reason. I would totally support. How, you got, folks, you don't want to mess around with the one thing you've been trying to get around since you've been dealing with sick buildings and water damaged buildings and things of like that is, you know, we want to get the moisture right. You don't want to have to keep one eye open at night wondering if that $50 savings that you had or more on a particular unit was really a savings in the end because these things are chronic and they creep in. Uh, it's, not, it's not something you wake up overnight. It's something you realize that maybe you weren't monitoring closely and, and a year later, the basement, you know, has a chronic issue and now you're looking at other issues and concerns, carpet removal, content replacement, you know, 
put your money where it's at. It's worth that value. What about sizing? You know, I get this a lot. You know, people are like, well, yeah, it says, uh, for example, this basement, this compact 70 is good for up to 1800 to 2200. But what's the metric? I mean, all houses are it's built. Some are built tight. It some are is, built leaky. It is very different. Um, so I would say that like that compact 70 right there is our most popular crawl space unit because of the footprint of the unit. Right. I mean, it can fit into a crawl space door. A lot of times crawl spaces aren't very high and all the more reason to make sure you're getting a quality dehumidifier if you have a crawl space. I don't care how well it's been encapsulated or closed at the end of the day, nobody wants to go into their crawl space. Yeah. Um, so you wanna make sure you have a good quality unit down there. But I would say that's our most popular, but the reality is if you go down to that next one, the Advanced 90, what's great about this unit is you'll see that little um, uh, on the side of the unit that is, is one of the, the exhaust. There's one of those on each side of the unit. So it's a dual exhaust unit. And what we recommend, especially in crawl spaces and in basements, to be honest with you, to some extent is put some uh, duct work, just standalone duct work on that unit and get the exhaust air away from the front. Ah, oh, you mean right here? Yes, right Got there. It. That makes yep. more sense now. Put, Got it. Put some flex duct on both sides. Um, run, you know, 10 feet away from the dehumidifier on each side because the dehumidistat or the sensor for the RH is in the front of that unit. All right. You don't want what any short cycling or you issues. You can get, you're, you're creating a microclimate only, yeah. almost right there. So, and air movement is so important when it comes to humidity control as well. Plus, trying to stop any condensation on the farthest corner of that crawl space. Right. So I, that's my number. If you can get that one through the crawl space door, but I would go more by, um, you know, how confident are we that we really tightened up that space, that we are controlling the environment from the infiltration because infiltration is the number one reason we're going to have high relative humidity once we get a good vapor barrier down, get things um, um, closed up. So um, I, typically I, I see for most crawl spaces about to a thousand square feet is where that compact goes. Yeah. And um, then from there, we usually go up, but it all is, is also based on monitoring. I am a huge advocate of monitoring. Yep. Um, we got to monitor to know what we're dealing with. And then also on budget. I mean, it, for some people, how our houses used to be when they were leaky, they would wet and dry and wet and dry and, and they were okay. Yeah. And for somebody who is not struggling with any health issues um, that could be very sensitive, that's an okay strategy. But the reality is our houses aren't leaky anymore. They're wetting, wetting, wetting. So we got to make sure that we get a dehumidifier in there that can handle it. But, Absolutely. Um, you know, I definitely speak with your contractor or if you're going to um, purchase our Santa Fe's, obviously we've got a, um, a, a retailer or an online retailer. They can answer a lot of questions for you if you have questions or call our customer service department. They, they answer these questions all the time and help people figure out what unit. And it's a huge takeaway. I mean, if, if anyone are gathering any pearls other than the need to keep that moisture in a certain range and using this type of equipment to accomplish that is this idea that there's other parameters, there's other things that might affect at the end of the day, not just the sizing of the unit, but the method, uh, the location, portable, whole house, uh, and other considerations. Don't just assume that it's as easy as pulling up to the drive through and ordering a number one and thinking that that might solve your problem because you could actually make things worse depending on what you want. Um, uh, so segue into um, another story, which is another topic on mechanical ventilation. I wanna share something with the audience. Um, about, it's probably been three or four years ago now, uh, I had a colleague who's, he's since passed away, but he, 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 he operated out of, um, uh, Florida and, um, I, I called him up one day because I was dealing with another, uh, client who was wanting mechanical ventilation. And one of the things that, 
you know, we know about mechanical ventilation is it's this idea that dilution is the solution. I know there's other t funny terms I'm sure we'll, we'll be saying in the next few minutes, but, but, but the, the point is, is that we understand that filtration isn't going to take care of everything. And sometimes, a lot of times, I would argue almost every time, it's about a bunch of things being in concert with each other uh, to, to improve the total indoor air quality. So where ventilation really helps remove some of the more gaseous contaminants and things of that nature. But in doing so, we came across a, a challenge and that's where my, my old colleague and friend Will came into play is that um, we were afraid that we were going to be bringing in moisture laden air into the home and worse yet, connecting it to a ductwork system where we were afraid that because more uh, laden, moist laden air hit a cool surface, we were gonna get condensation and as you might imagine, a humongous microbial problem. So I called him up, I said, you know, Will, you're in Florida. I heard it's humid and hot there from time to time. <laughs> um, what are you using? And he, he pointed me to this exact unit that you see on your screen right now. Um, I, I, I kind of fell over my chair because I'm like, are these people on the same wavelength with us as what we're trying to accomplish big picture? And I know that this unit might not be fit for every scenario, but I'd like you to take a few minutes and talk about this unit. It's not just a dehumidifier, is it? And how it might be able to help people who are worried about dumping in moisture laden air in their home uh, in their quest to bring in fresh air from the outside. Sure, so the Ultra Air Ventilating Dehumidifiers, this is one of our larger units. Again, bigger box, bigger unit for more yeah, square have... footage. But we do have, um, starting again at that 70 pints right there, that's the only one that doesn't have a dedicated ventilation duct. I saw that, but I'm seeing but, it here. But you can um, integrate into the return of this dehumidifier um, the ventilation. So you okay. can get the same ventilation strategy with that unit it's just that because it's so small and designed for smaller mechanical rooms um you know <laughs> we never run into those do yeah, we yeah <laughs> exactly all the time um that you still can get the ventilation and the filtration so that's we, great. we invented ventilating dehumidifiers in 1996 and when i say we the gentleman's name is ken gehring um, he is uh, in his early 80s now and is very active on a HVAC forum called HVAC Talk, and he's known as Teddy Bear. Yeah. So he answers a lot of questions about moisture control in homes. He's very passionate about this. And um, so you can get dedicated fresh air ventilation with this dehumidifier, meaning that we're going to hook it up to a controller, whether it's a controller that we offer or your thermostat might have ventilation worked into it. And when you set up your ventilation program, that's going to um, turn the fan on in the dehumidifier and we're going to bring in fresh air through that duct right there. And at the same time, we are going to bring in return air from the house from the, d the duct next to it. Got it. So right those there. two round ducts, so that's in, in whatever the CFM of that unit is. So let's say, um, the, to make it simple, the 70 pint unit is 150 CFM. Okay. So the max ventilation that we can get from the unit is one third of the total CFM. Oh, you're so gonna make I me can, do math now. So okay. that's 50, that's why I use that one. I'm not good at math. <laughs> yeah, thank so you. we can get 50 CFM of ventilation air from that unit, that 70 pint smaller unit. And when it brings it in, it's gonna pull air, 100 CFM from the house, and it's gonna mix it in the box, and then it's gonna deliver it to the home. And I'm saying right now that that's just ventilation. We don't have the compressor on for the dehumidifier um, because the RH might not be high enough in the house to justify running the compressor for the dehumidifier. So let me catch up with you, and I do yeah. mean that. So yeah. you're, you're calling a scenario out where maybe the, rel the relative humidity in the house has been satisfied to where we want it, but you and so, but you know, uh, in this convenient example, it's more warm, more moist outside. So you're mixing almost like an ERV, uh, mixing the air inside to um, temper to, it. to temper the the humidity, kind of spread it out a little bit. Yep. And then where does the I don't I don't know if we call it like smart 
brain software. When, when does it kick on? Does it kick on the dehumidifier if it senses the? What if the moisture is too much outside? Well, if the moisture is too much outside and the relative humidity raises in the house due to ventilation, people activities, mm. all that, then we'll turn the dehumidifier, the compressor on and start running it. Now, what that means is if we're ventilating at the same time, as we're trying to dehumidify the living space, we will remove some moisture from that air. Right. But the reality is, is be, you, you need exposure time um, in order to remove moisture and one pass over the coils really isn't going to remove that much moisture. And I have this conversation all the time because everybody wants to run their homes um, similar to way a commercial building is run. We want to remove moisture from the ventilation air before it is distributed through a large commercial building. And there are very expensive, large systems that are put on top of buildings in order to do that, right. um, that can be costly to run. And if we were gonna run a compressor all the time in New Orleans from April to October to try to remove moisture from 50 CFM of ventilation air, people are not gonna be happy with their energy bills at all, nor are they going to be happy with the amount of heat that's going to be generated for that dehumidifier to remove a small amount of moisture from a small amount of ventilation air. Well, and this might be one of those hard truths, and we can deal with that here. That's what we're looking yep. for is that transparency yep. is what I'm hearing you say and what I'm hearing you imply is that there will be certain climates, certain times of the year where you may not realistically be able to get say what you think is what the amount of fresh air you're getting from the outside because of what you just explained the the amount of work that this system would have to do and how that would directly impact you we're not talking about five dollars here on your utility bill we're talking about a significant uh difference in your bill that you, you're there's there's just tricky parts where there might be parts of the year where you don't get that optimal um, ventilation that you want. You're not going to open up in New Orleans in the summertime. You're not going to crack open your windows and get a draft because it's too hot. It's too humid. Yeah. You're trying to get some of that, that, that ventilation made up with a unit like this. But, and again, unless you commercialize this, and it is true, even with some of the COVID recommendations I've been seeing, they're talking about air changes per hour. Where, like people are basing these things off of commercial applications, not realizing like that some of this has to do with occupancy setting, you know, constant, you know, numbers and thinking, oh, I just, I just want to ask for like 12 air changes. I heard Boeing uh, has 20 to 30 air changes uh, per hour. I want that in my home. And they're not realizing what those numbers mean. So yeah, it, down it's, your walls. <laughs> right. Live in a tent, go yep. outside or, or, hey, I know, and this is a hard one for some people. You may have to look at moving if it ends up being detrimental to you. Now that those are the outliers with yeah, the people yeah. that we work with. It's not the main part. So, so we're and acknowledging. And I would say that, to be honest with you, if, if we are minimizing our infiltration yeah. um, as much as possible, adding a dehumidifier to a system, and if it's the right size dehumidifier, and we're not looking at astronomical numbers in ventilation here, a dehumidifier should be able to handle a... In, usually in conjunction with some air conditioning. Yeah. It, it should be able to handle, those two systems together should be able to handle the moisture loads from adding ventilation, uh, even a little bit of additional ventilation in a home. Now, if you're truly concerned about it um, and and maybe money is is not what we're thinking about here, but the Cadillac potentially could be adding an ERV and letting the ERV do the ventilation because it will reduce the moisture load yep. that's coming. It's still going to add to it. It's still going to contribute to the moisture load because it's an exchange. Yep. Um, and then setting up the dehumidifier, which all of these can be set up just to dehumidify. You don't have Downstream to of the ERV. Actually, the ERV should have its own ductwork. Independent. Got it. Independent. 
Um, we have an article on Green Building Advisor. If you go to greenbuildingadvisor.com and type in ERV, there's mm -hmm. an article that comes up that a colleague of mine, David Shrelevin, wrote that talks about all the different ways to integrate our dehumidifiers with an ERV mm -hmm. and all the considerations, pros and cons with all of those different installs. The Cadillac is to keep them separate, give the ERV its own ductwork and then tie the dehumidifier to the HVAC system just to focus on the relative humidity in the house. And for my own ignorance, you're welcome audience, um, just as a friendly reminder, so I hear what you're saying, dedicated ductwork, which means multi-point ductwork penetrating into the house at say common areas, master bedroom, living room, the office, it's not every room. And the reason you would separate that out from your primary air conditioning system that may have a whole house dehumidifier on it is because that ERB in that type of a humid setting may be able to better complement what your goals are, 50% uh, relative humidity or less and more fresh air coming in there and not having any sort of secondary concerns with if you, versus if you just had a venting dehumidifier. Is that accurate or did I butcher that up? Um, I mean, it's, again, it, it really depends on the mechanical systems, the house, the budget. The <laughs> there's, one. In there. there's, there's so much to go into that. And a good friend of ours, Matt Reisinger, who is a builder in Austin, Texas, who has his own YouTube channel now and is, is really educating builders and homeowners, um, you know, his Cadillac would be an ERV and a dehumidifier, but it, you know, he admits a lot of my clients don't have that budget. So I would recommend the ventilating dehumidifier for that, right. that reason. Now, most homes aren't tight enough that they, in, in a humid climate, in a warm, humid climate, the recommendation for ventilation is to do a slight positive pressure on the house, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We want to stop the hot, wet air coming in through our walls as much as possible. We've got so much negative pressure going on our home. We've got bath fans, we've got kitchen hoods, we've got dryers. So our houses a lot of time are sucking in air through the cracks and crevices. So it's not being filtered, not being conditioned. Um, so if we can try with our dehumidifiers, we are a supply ventilation. So we can try to help make up some of that air and try to achieve a, a slight positive pressure on the house to stop wet, hot air moving through our walls. You're trying to address one of the driving forces and counter it with positive pressure. Exactly. So this is a topic that I usually salivate on. Let me finish up one question <laughs> okay. that so I can formally get out of the way. Yep. Um, okay, so the ventilation, we talk about, you know, who came up with the numbers? Like how much does a person I know the word need is totally subjective, but who creates the minimums and how do you guys design your systems to deliver uh, the appropriate or minimum amount? Because there's different size homes out there with different size leakage. Some houses are really tight, some are very leaky. How, does, um, how do these products, uh, specifically the ultra air units, um, how are they designed to bring it to be, are they doing six X-ray 62.2? What are they using here? So the contractor installing contractor would be able to set that up based on whatever standard, if they're using 62.2, if they know they've got someone in the house that needs a little bit more. When I, you know, I say one third of the ventilation um, CFM of that unit. Sometimes if we need more ventilation air, um, we can transition that six inch duct to an eight inch and bring in a little bit more outdoor air if it's needed. I've got some houses right now um, in Maryland and in Wilmington where we're doing that because there's somebody in the home that, you know, homes that have sensitivities. So okay. there are ways that your contractor can achieve more or, you know, but it is designed. There's a damper in there. These hook up to a mechanical damper that can be adjusted. As soon as there's a call for ventilation, it opens and the fan comes on and brings in that amount of air that it's been set up, set hopefully points. tested, yes, yeah. ho hopefully tested, commissioned to know 
that we're bringing in that amount of fresh air as well. We're doing so, some blower door testing on the back end and we're making appropriate uh, adjustments to see if it's meeting some minimum. What I'm also hearing you say is that these built, these units have wiggle room. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yep, that's absolutely. the whole point. Yep, you can go down or up. And then it's really a flow test into that duct that they're, they're gonna do. But yeah, we need to be doing blower door tests on our home and duct blaster tests. We need to you know make our homes, it's, it's you know, people, and I work with builders, you know, we're making houses too tight. We're making people sick. And that's not the reality. Yeah. The reality is our homes need to be tight. So we have the ability to control all the air that is in the home. Right. We 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 got that, the energy efficiency thing down. We just have that inverse relationship with health, and we see this. This is nothing yep. new, by the way. We saw sick building syndrome coined decades ago as we started raising yep. occupancy rates, building the houses and or the buildings tighter, and seeing um, a drop off in work attendance, uh, and a, uh, an increase in symptomology, uh, headaches, and discomfort, and all these other things. And in the very beginning, we didn't know what was going on. We just thought people wanted to go and uh, start their vacation earlier, but we started to realize these are those chronic things. Um, uh, you know, Mrs. Smith's arm didn't fall off at, on Tuesday when she came to work, so she must not have a problem. And we've evolved since then, and we've realized that, you know what, you, you, it wasn't but, well, I was going to say it wasn't but 100 years ago. It, it wasn't but 150 years ago that we were living in buildings that were more like wooden shacks, and it wasn't much longer before that that our, we were just, the tree covered us, and that was it. We've, over the course of 200 years, we've rapid-fired uh, tight building conditions, um, and I don't think our, 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 our evolution, our genetics have caught up with the consequences of contaminant um, increases. Um, and then we, we add insult to injury by saying, not only are we gonna go ahead and make that building tighter for you so it doesn't breathe right, but we're gonna use in more toxic building materials too. Exactly. And, that's, and it's just like this yeah. the wildfire. It's the, the no good deed goes unpunished, right? Yeah. We were chasing that one thing, which was energy efficiency. Um, and what happens when you change what, you know, chase one thing, we create a lot of other problems. I know, you know, we're getting, um, there's that recommendation out there because of COVID right now, where you keep your relative humidity between 40 and 60. Yeah. And I hate throwing out relative humidities because it's relative to a temperature. And a lot of people don't understand that. We get that all the time. Um, in the winter time, crawl spaces and the dehumidifier is not coming on. Well, the reality is at 40 degrees and 60 or 70% relative humidity, that's a really small amount of water that's in the air. Yeah. And so what we need to understand is it's relative to a temperature because my concern is people are like, well, a 40 degree, you know, 40% is good, then 60% is better. And if you try to get 60% relative humidity in Wisconsin in the middle of winter, you're going to create a lot of mold, microbial growth, moisture issues in homes by pumping in too much moisture um, into our homes. Yeah, so I mean, I think the struggle careful. the struggle for colder climates is to get the the relative humidity up enough from a, a, an arguably too much of a minimum, like say um, 10, 15, 20 percent to something maybe 20, 30, 40 percent, which is some, in some areas very difficult oh. to achieve. Yeah. Um, even in Arizona in the wintertime, it gets down to the single digits. And you talk about people that have respiratory and skins cracking left and right and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. But you're right. It's all re you. I guess we've gotten away with a lot over time. And we had a lot of wiggle room when we had really leaky homes. And when we yeah. made the houses tighter, the wiggle room got a little bit narrower. And now we, we're hitting the walls and we're running into problems that otherwise we're going, we never even realized going back to your analogies that the old leaky homes would get wet, they would dry, they would get wet, they yeah. would get dry. And now they're not bounding back as quickly. They're, they're, we've built a tighter sponges uh, for moisture to hold on to, and it's an issue. Um, and, and we really need to make our homes healthy all the time in order so we can have, you know, we can fight off things. So that's where I was getting with, you know, we don't want to chase the one thing. We don't want to listen to experts because we're concerned about one thing. We really want to create a healthy home so our bodies are prepared to fight all different kinds of things that are coming at us. Right. Total indoor air quality, as yeah. holistic as we can get. We understand that it's not going to cover every single thing, but if you could create the biggest umbrella 
you know, do we have targets and ranges? And the answer is absolutely left. I thought uh, is yes. I thought we, uh, you did an excellent job on a recent interview where, you know, I think I, it, you were talking about Joe Lisbrick from Building Science and, yeah. it, and, and people are like, 10 steps and, and the response that Joseph gave, maybe you could expand upon it was like 10 steps forward, one step back. And it was the, it was the whining part of energy efficiency. You know, guys, you, we, we, we are so blessed and so fortunate to have all these, these wonderful things to make a house a home and comfortable, but it takes energy unless you start getting to like passive home building, which is not your standard home. Most homes are not operate like that to be able to create a sanctuary. And that sanctuary is, is not perfectly defined, but we're, we're getting better as we learn more. And, and moisture is one of those things that I think we got a pretty good handle on. You know, you want that 40 to 60% during the summer months, you're probably gonna get probably more to the 20 to 40% in the winter months. But the point is, is that you don't wanna go excessive on either side because there's consequences on either end. Absolutely, and, and basically what Joe was saying is, you know, somebody had said, well, you're, you know, we're making our houses so energy efficient. You know, it was at a conference where it was all about getting to energy efficiency in our homes. And now you tell us we got to use a dehumidifier. And that's when he said, you know, 10 steps forward, one step back. And you can't energy conserve your way to dry. Right. There it is. And I think that ventilation and uh, moisture control are always going to be an energy penalty. Yeah. But the reality is they can, they create our healthy environments. So, um, you might spend a little bit more money on you, the lungs of your house, your HVAC system of your house, but ultimately your insurance and your premiums and trips to the doctor and missing work and missing school and all those things hopefully will go down because we are committing up front to having a healthier indoor environment in our homes. And, and an easier sell to make. Uh, for the audience members that we primarily work with, because these are folks that are spending five to ten thousand dollars a month in medical bills, treatment, or other solutions in order to quote unquote survive and certainly not thrive. Um, and so it's an easy sale. We're looking for the long game, and it doesn't take much for that ROI to get your money back uh, in the terms of utility and health. You mentioned something, um, Nikki, on. Uh, ventilation specific to pressure differentials and uh, exhaust uh, balanced and, 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 and positive uh, pressure ventilation. And that is something that when my very younger, in my younger years, I learned at an early age uh, about um, balanced and slightly positive. And we understood that uh, slightly positive could help create uh, a, 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 an invisible barrier, if you will, to minimize communications from interstitial spaces and just promote the um, purging, if you will, of contaminants a little bit more efficient. Uh, I, t I guess I have one question and probably some follow-ups is, um, you mentioned uh, the venting dehumidifier being uh, positive, um, and you've mentioned limitations of exhaust, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, I, I remember I did a, a presentation back in 2015 to uh, a, co a conference I was at, and, and it was reviewing this article on ventilation, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. Oh, it's absolutely. usually the same names. And they talk about how central and ERV ventilation ended up being superior to exhaust. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to that a little bit to our audience of one of the, what are some of those concerns, again, of not just the contaminant aspect of it, but are there concerns with... Um, I've heard people talk about moisture being brought in. In a certain climate, if you do exhaust ventilation, you can cause problems in interstitial cavities. Do you have any, you have any tips or thoughts on that? Oh, geez. So um, absolutely. I think the majority of the larger developers, builders, HVAC contractors, um, this time of the year, I start getting a lot of phone calls because what happens um, when they're doing their plan designs and they're trying to check off all the boxes and, and meet the code, which code is minimum. Um, I mean, unfortunately, it's the crappiest house that we can build legally. <laughs> um, so, and, and the thing is, is the reality is, is now our codes are starting to get better to put pushing us to tighter homes and that sort of thing. But ventilation is not sexy. It's not the Corian countertops or the, the fixtures. So it's usually the cheapest uh, strategy that we can put in a house to check the box. And that's going to be exhaust ventilation. Um, so in humid and mixed humid climates, which I would say the mid-Atlantic uh, down to the, the southern regions, 
um, we really should not be using exhaust only ventilation as our ventilation strategies. What are we worried about there? We are going to be for every, for every CFM of air that goes out, we're sucking in that equivalent CFM somewhere else in the house. So a uh, prime example, um, we've got some townhouses in Maryland exhaust only ventilation on the third floor, continuous ventilation on the bath fan. And these are three ACH 50 townhouses. They're tight, they're tight townhouses. The bathroom on the first floor is actually sucking in air through the um, ductwork into the bathroom as the makeup air for the exhaust going up at the top. And what happens is when you bring in, suck in air through that ductwork for that bath fan on the first level, it's warm, it's humid, and there's a supply fan or a supply register for the AC in that bathroom. So now we're raining because we're condensing on that first floor mm -hmm. bath. So we, every time air is being sucked out, we're sucking in the equivalent CFM. Our houses are always trying to get to a neutral pressure inside. And so, and we don't know where it's coming from and it's not filtered, it's not conditioned. And potentially if it's coming through our walls, it's condensing. So positive pressure changes mm -hmm. that how for us, that concern. So it, it, if, if we look at our homes, um, you know, Thermal dynamics, we're gonna throw it out there. Hot is trying to go to cold. So when it's hot outside in your air conditioning inside, that hot air is trying to come in. So all the pressures are against your house. The wet air outside is trying to come to that air conditioned drier air inside. And high goes to low. So that means when we're exhausting, we're sucking in somewhere. What we wanna do is we want to try to bring in some outdoor air um, and put, try to put a slight positive pressure in our homes. And it's, yep. it's never going to be, even balanced ventilation is never truly balanced ventilation. Right. Right. It's just trying to exhaust and supply a little. And even some ERVs now, you can set up um, your balanced ventilation on the supply side to offer, um, to be a little bit more positive. Right. You can so, put a damper on there, sure. Yeah, you know, they're, so they have, well, they have different, yeah, different fans and then put a damper on there. So we can try to get a positive pressure, which is very important in our, in our humid climates to try to try to achieve that. So what about the bilin, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, okay, so what Nikki's saying is that we definitely want to avoid exhaust ventilation in a warm, humid climate. Does the opposite exist in a cold, dry climate? Um, potentially, but the risks aren't as, um, because we're colder inside um, and it is war or, or warmer inside and it's colder outside, the reality is, is our houses are big, like big hot air balloons. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're running exhaust only, it's just going to amplify that even more. Um, right. And if we try to do a little bit of, of supply, it, you're not going to put typically enough pressure on that house to worry about driving the moisture right. um, into the walls because the thermodynamics of, of what's happening to that house is um, you, you, you can't stop it. It's hard to sharply define in past scales or, 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 or air ACHs what the uh, turning point is for too much or not enough when it comes to the method of ventilation, exhaust, positive balance, that sort of thing. Um, and, I, and I think the, the, the irony of it is, is, to, is that most homes, um, you know, a wind, uh, a strong wind from outside will depressurize or pressurize the home depending on the nature. Um, meanwhile, you're using that 200 CFM uh, kitchen hood exhaust that's pulling out in most homes, the, the builders, I was lucky to work with a couple of them, but most of them didn't even have um, intentional makeup air uh, for those hoods. Uh, and so there's it, intermittent, the dryer, intermittent use of exhaust fans. But, but the takeaway here is that there's also a big difference between it being intermittent and more continuous or chronic. If you're, if you're uh, building bad science into it and then constantly exhausting air on a more regular basis where it can do what Nikki described for that hot, humid climate, that's a potential red flag right there. And I think that's the takeaway. And I always, you know, again, 
I, we want to look at what's happening with our buildings when, when we do have moisture issues and take steps to make sure that when we apply a dehumidifier, it's going to be successful. If we're running continuous exhaust only ventilation, well, let's try to go to intermittent or, you know, let's try to like occupy times. Let's right. try to minimize that a little bit and um, see what that does to our H with the understanding that that might not be the healthiest strategy for the people in that home. Well, so, what you what you you gave a, a couple of pearls right there, and I think what you also did is you're just dealing with reality. We can't talk about everybody like they're living on the top of the hill and that they have money falling out of their back yeah. pocket. Many, the a vast majority, ninety nine percent of the people I deal with have a deal breaking budget issue, yeah. and so it's trying to prioritize that. I think moisture control is absolutely the, a huge thing when it, when it comes from microbials or off gassing of VOCs. That is number one for me. If not, it's just going to be this. I don't care what filter you are using in your house um, at this point. If you have a mold gr issue growing in your basement, in your crawl space, uh, or a number of other locations, I love the idea of mechanical ventilation and what you guys have done to try and loop it into the dehumidification system and even providing that, that potential thought process for, I don't want to call it a Cadillac solution, but a dedicated ERV uh, separate from uh, a dehumidifier for the air conditioning system to help it do its job so that you have the best of best. This is what we're talking about. We're trying to create a sanctuary, keeping that building dry enough uh, which minimizes a lot of potential concerns, off-gassing, dust mite production, mold, bacteria. I mean, this is what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Mechanical ventilation is great. Um, you know, there's people that live in coastal climates where it's not so hot. Think about the Bay Area in California. We love to leave our doors and our windows open, and I, and I don't discourage that. I mean, if there's a wildfire, you might want to try and close up the house a little bit yeah. better. But me where mechanical ventilation, and maybe you can talk to this a little bit, is is really for me to be – to to assist the home during the parts or the times of the year where you can't open up a window and get that fresh air. We're, we're not saying you have to live like a robot in your home. We do want to make it as much of a sanctuary as possible for you. But no one, no one on this call is saying, oh, by all means, you definitely need to stop with natural ventilation. There are just so many times where natural ventilation is not a viable solution for people. And, and it's becoming more and more. Um, you know, when I lived in Wisconsin out in the country on five acres, I had no problem opening up my windows. Now I'm in Northern Virginia in a, you know, in a subdivision and I don't want to know what my neighbors are doing, mowing the lawn, all this stuff all the time. So definitely have my house closed up far more yeah. than I used to. And, you know, and, and I'm sure you, you deal with this all the time, but the closer you live to highways, the worse the air quality is yep. and, and we're, we're concerned more about this PM 2.5 and those particles that are so small that are working their way into our blood system now. Yep. So it's, it, 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 it all depends on where you live and what you're dealing with. And absolutely, if you can open up your windows and get some fresh air, you should do that. But I was on a, a, a video or a, an interview and somebody in Colorado was, you know, open up your windows all the time. We should have them open. And I'm, and it was March in Northern Virginia and everything's covered in yellow pollen outside. Yeah, right, right. So as, as ideal as the conditions were from a temperature and relative humidity standpoint. Doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that everybody can do that and it just makes sense for everybody. So we, even then, you know, we might open our windows for two or three hours and then we close up. And then we want to make sure that when we close it up, that we're cleaning that air. And, and that is a strategy that um, we have to think about as well, especially for anybody who is running continuous fan on their HVAC system during the, the air conditioning season. Let's talk about that a little bit, filtration. So, you know, filtration is very important, not only to keep our systems clean, but obviously to try to remove as much as the particulate that is airborne making its way. Now, the bigger the particle, the harder it is for it to make its way to that filter, right. obviously. But um, my experience is, is that people will put in a high efficiency air cleaner on their HVAC system, especially mm. if if they have allergies and respiratory issues, they're upgrading that filter. Mm -hmm. And typically when they are experiencing um, 
respiratory issues is during those allergy seasons. So they're going to run the fan all the time, trying to move the air through the house all the time. And the challenge with that is if we've been running our air conditioner and we've loaded up the coils on that, uh, on the air conditioner um, to cool the air and we shut and they, and it can't shut off. So the compressor of the air conditioner shuts off, yeah. but the fan still goes, sure. we're going to re-evaporate all that moisture that's on those coils back into the house. Mm. So um, the coils are usually hold two to three pints of water per ton. So if you've got a three ton HVAC system, you potentially have nine pints or pounds of water on those coils. Yeah. And so what happens is all, you know, anything on those coils will re-evaporate back into the air. And that potentially could be a reason why we have high relative humidity in the house. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's, you're paying for that filtration and you want that filtration all the time, but we, then we're going to create a moisture issue. So again, adding a dedicated dehumidifier potentially to that can, can really help with that. Right. Such a struggle, uh, the issue of filtration beyond the low hanging fruit right. arguments of, you know, I want to have hospital grade HEPA filtration in my whole house system, mm -hmm. not realizing that these most systems aren't designed to have that, um, that resistance from the air filter. Newer systems and the manufacturers are obviously w have wisened up over the recent decades uh, to knowing that consumers are, they don't just, they don't want a, a standard throwaway um, a big box store filter anymore. They're, they're going for that MERV 13, that MERV 14 and up. Um, and that we know also, also if you make the, the filter thicker, it gives you more surface area, which is less resistance, all these wonderful things. It still boils down to every situation is, di is, is different. And you can't just have tunnel vision and say, I'm going to address my dehumidification by buying this unit. I'm going to address my mechanical ventilation by buying this unit. I'm going to buy this really cool filter because it got good reviews on Google and not consider the consequences of them. I think you, you were very wise in the beginning to talk about reaching out to a qualified contractor and, and or professional to have them guide you through this. I, I wish it was easy as just three puzzle pieces being stuck together and there's a, your solution. But one thing, you might not have the physical room for an, a, a better filter. Uh, let alone whether or not your system can handle it. Same goes for the dehumidifier. What I love about uh, Thermostore is that the product line is expanding and they give you a lot of different options. So let me, let me ask you a question before we sign off. I definitely want to uh, let people who are listening, whether it's contractors, consumers, know how they can reach out and learn more because you're a wealth. Any other um, pearls of wisdom, food for thought, re-emphasis that you want to tell our audience? I have very uh, been very involved with a lot of builders, architects, mechanical designers over the last several years. And it amazes me what the budget is to build a house. And if we break it down, how much of it is going to the HVAC system? And it is so minute um, that it, it really is upsetting to me that we are not spending more time and money on, again, the lungs of our home, right? This is our comfort. This is our health. Ultimately, it helps protect our property. And the amount of budget from building a house um, that goes into it is so small. And we, need, and we need to change that for new construction as much as possible moving forward. And, you know, hopefully look at what's existing out there. And when we're looking at remodeling our homes or fixing our homes, we're taking into consideration where we're allocating those do dollars and ultimately what's going to have the most benefit to our own lives and our, and our families as well, because the health aspect of it is so important. And the reality is everybody, you know, wants to spend all this stuff on a really cool house and then they get in it and it's uncomfortable and they're really upset about it right and right. and so we need to think about those things that maybe aren't that we're not seeing again air we're not seeing um thinking about those things ahead of time and really trying to make good decisions 
That's well said. Uh, you wish you could get on the front of it when, uh, if you're looking at building a new house, how can I get involved? How can I get my air conditioning company in called and, and going to bat for me? I know sometimes that's easier said than done. Someone who's working with a custom builder, there's a lot more wiggle rooms. Uh, another builder that's doing track homes, spec homes, you're not going to have a lot of wiggle room. They're going to tell you this is what you're going to get. You can modify afterwards, uh, that sort of thing. Um, existing, there's the issue now, a lot of homes, there's, there's these new markets emerging, have been emerging with existing homes you know, unit replacement, uh, all these additions. Uh, so Nikki is your such... own advocate, right? I mean, yeah. you, you've got to share because a lot of times people don't think of these little things like my daughter has indoor allergies and she's very sensitive to dust mites. Uh... Share that information up front. Make sure it's known because there are actions that can be taken ahead of time that are going to cost you a lot less ahead of time than if you try to go in and try to fix it after. Amen. Amen. Nikki, I, I know that I haven't known you for years, but <laughs> in the last few months, I've obviously done some research and I've watched you talk on other shows and just see who the human side of who you are. And I think you're one of those good, you know, one of the good people. Thank I think you're, you. you're nerdily passionate like I am. <laughs> I, I, you know, your background, your, you know, your bio in of itself speaks for itself. But um, what I really want to do right now is just take a moment to ask uh, a question. People who are listening, who are your guys' primary audience? I mean, is it Mr. and, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner or is it HVAC contractors? Who are you guys uh, mainly speaking with? It's, it's really the residential market overall. It, 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 and, and when I'm saying residential, it could be a developer of multifamily affordable housing. Um, it's consumers, it's contractors, it's architects, it's builders, it's anybody who's touching our homes and can make a difference in how they are being uh, designed and maintained and helping create healthier, more comfortable environments. Right. So for people who are listening, who are obviously those sorts of folks, I mean, without a doubt, coming also from an HVAC background uh, on my end in the residential market, um, this definitely seems like such a wonderful starting point, uh, just where these guys are at, the innovation, where their hearts are at, to be honest with you, at the end of the day, they're not focused on the dollar sign, they're focused on the service, the, the product, the rest will come. Um, I also see that there's a resources page. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that some of this is available to anybody. You don't have to just be an HVAC company for those inquiring minds. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the product, obviously. I mean, we have a lot of information on our website to oh. help guide homeowners understand um, potentially what they need in their home. And right. if it's going to be attached to the HVAC system, it is going to go through an HVAC contractor um, right. for that install. But our Santa Fe crawl space and basement de dehumidifiers, we have a lot of contractors that do install those because a lot of people don't want to go in their crawl space. And, and the reality is, is there has to be work done in a crawl space before you can add a dehumidifier. You right. got to close those vents. You, there's, there's steps that need to be taken. Right. But we do have um, an online retailer um, available on our website where the Santa Fe products can be purchased. Very good. And, and clearly, there's a lot of articles here, uh, again, for the inquiring minds wanting to learn more. This is a great starting point for you. Nikki, I want to thank you for coming on IEP Radio today. The topic of uh, moisture control and ventilation is arguably the top two things I talk about with every client I work with. And I'm so thankful, so grateful that you're able to share your knowledge and, uh, knowledge and also provide actual products. These are amazing. I, I have um, a lot of people I've worked with that have used your guys' products, no complaints. CCs keep on running. They're like a train. They just keep on going. And, and, and so thank you for all the hard work you're doing. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. The content of this show is for informational purposes and represents the sole opinion of the host and its interviewees only. Any reliance on the information provided in this show is done at your own risk. Additional opinions and or research may change our current view of the topics spoken in this show. We do our best to minimize any inaccuracies presented and make legitimate efforts to back all comments with our own field experience, independent literature, or studies that support the topics discussed. 
This information should not be used to make conclusive decisions regarding your health or exposure. Ultimately, all questions and or concerns regarding your health should be addressed by a qualified physician. Additional exposure concerns and or questions pertaining to the health of your home or building should be addressed by qualified and on-site professionals. Any and all products and services discussed in this show should not be construed as a recommendation, endorsement, or guarantee that their use is appropriate for your situation. In short, we hope this information is of value to you, but please do not act upon it without actual and individual consultation and guidance by professionals who have taken the time and appropriate collection of data to assess your unique situation.